Today, I'm going to reveal to you the secrets of life itself. I'm going to give you the formula to a magic elixir that can keep anyone alive. I'm talking, of course, about vasopressors and inotropes. Before we get too deep into this, I want to make sure we are clear about our definitions. There is really a difference between vasopressors and inotropes. These words cannot be used interchangeably. Vasopressors cause a constriction of small arteries that makes the blood pressure higher by increasing total peripheral resistance. Inotropes, on the other hand, increase cardiac contractility. This means they make the heart work harder. People frequently use the two terms interchangeably because many medications have both vasopressor and inotropic effects, but that just causes confusion for everybody. In order to properly understand how these drugs work, we need to first review receptor physiology. The action of the medication is determined by the receptor they can bind to and where that receptor is located. Some medications will bind to multiple different receptors depending on the concentration of that medication. Now the two major players are subtypes of adrenergic receptors, designated alpha and beta. Within the alpha receptor group, the most important one for us is alpha-1, which exists on the vascular wall of the small arteries and causes contraction of the vascular muscles. There are also two beta receptors to know about, beta-1 and beta-2. Beta-1 receptors are located on the heart muscle. Now stimulation of beta-1 receptors causes an increase in the heart rate and inotropy. Beta-2 receptors, on the other hand, are also found on the small arteries, like alpha-1 receptors. But their main effect is to cause vasodilation. Different from the adrenergic receptors, there's also a class of receptors that bind dopamine. There are many different dopamine receptors out there, but you really, just to keep it simple, need to understand that dopamine receptors mostly are in the splanchnic circulation. They cause dilation of those vascular beds. But at higher and higher concentrations, dopamine can then start binding to alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors. There are a few practical principles you need to keep in mind when using vasopressors and inotropes. Number one, vasopressors are indicated for a fall in systolic blood pressure of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury or a fall in the mean arterial pressure below 60 millimeters of mercury when there's evidence of shock. Number two, you need to remember the importance of keeping the tank full because vasopressors don't work effectively when the patient is hypovolemic. Number three, you should start low with your titration and increase the dose gradually to obtain the clinical effect you want. Fourthly, if you are on the maximum dose for that medication, then you need to add a second agent and you really probably should reconsider your approach. Maybe there's something else going on here. Fifth, all vasopressors and inotropes need to be given through a central line. There are some short-term indications for using a peripheral line, but this should only be done in the guidance of your attending physician. Six, always be mindful of the hemodynamic effects of the medication that you're giving. So for example, vasopressors increase mean arterial pressure by increasing systemic vascular resistance. This necessarily will cause an increase in the afterload which can lead to a decrease in the cardiac output. This may be the opposite effect of what you're actually intending to do. Now it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of these magical medications. Starting off with vasopressors, the most common one used is norepinephrine. This hormone acts on both alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors and causes a dual effect of vasoconstriction and an increase in cardiac output. The usual dose range is up to 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per minute. It's most commonly used as a first-line therapy vasoconstrictor in septic shock. Now this is because septic shock causes an inappropriate vasodilation and we need to increase the systemic vascular resistance. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1 receptor vasopressor. This medication will increase your blood pressure, but it will also decrease your cardiac output by increasing afterload. This medication is dosed up to 200 micrograms per minute and its primary use is a temporary bolus vasoconstrictor during surgery or during procedures 
or as an infusion for treating neurogenic shock since this is another case of inappropriate vasodilation. Epinephrine is one of those medications that has a dual effect depending on the concentration infused. At low doses, it has a very strong beta-1 effect to increase cardiac output, but at a higher dose, the alpha-1 vasoconstrictor effects becomes much more predominant. This dose range is similar to norepinephrine as up to 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per minute. It's frequently used as a second-line agent in septic shock, but also has a primary use in anaphylaxis and also after coronary bypass surgery. Ephedrine is another medication that is primarily used as a short-term vasoconstrictor. It has a modest effect on alpha-2 receptors, but mostly by forcing the release of norepinephrine. So it's used rarely as a post-anesthetic hypotensive agent because it's secondary, it relies on the secondary release of norepinephrine and it becomes increasingly ineffective over time as the supply of norepinephrine runs out. It's usually given in five to 10 milligram boluses at a time. Dopamine, on the other hand, will stimulate a wide variety of receptors depending on the dose. And at a lower dose, the D1 Splanchnic receptors are activated and vasodilate. As you increase the dose, the beta-1 receptors start to become much more stimulated and increase the heart rate. And then at a higher dose than that, the alpha-1 receptors are stimulated to vasoconstrict. But this is a much weaker effect than other medications available. We usually will dose dopamine as up to 15 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Its overall use in critical care, however, is rapidly decreasing, except in cases of bradycardia as a bridge to a pacemaker. Vasopressin is secretion from the posterior pituitary gland, and in shock, it binds to V1 receptors to cause vasoconstriction. It's primarily used as a second-line agent in vasodilatory shock. It has a fixed dose of 0.04 units per minute with no titration. There are two inotropes in common use in critical care. First one is dolbutamine, which binds to beta-1 receptors to increase cardiac output. It also causes a reflex vasodilation that occurs because of this increase in cardiac output. Dolbutamine also has a beta-2 effect causing peripheral vasodilation, which augments the increase in cardiac output. Its most important use is in the treatment of heart failure and cardiogenic shock. But the peripheral vasodilation effect is also beneficial in septic shock to decrease small vessel shunting and improve oxygen delivery in the capillaries. It's usually dosed in a range between 5 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Milrinone is unique as it does not work through adrenergic receptor binding. It blocks phosphodiesterase, which breaks down cyclic AMP inside the cells. Both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors cause an increase in cyclic AMP inside the cells, which acts as a second messenger. Blocking the breakdown of cyclic AMP thus potentiates the effects of beta-1 and beta-2 receptor activation, and it can lead to an increase in the cardiac output as well as a vasodilation. It's used much like dolbutamine in the management of congestive heart failure and cardiogenic shock, but because of its intercellular action, it takes longer for it to reach a therapeutic concentration. So this drug is dosed differently as an initial bolus of 50 micrograms per kilogram, followed by a continuous infusion of 0.125 to 0.75 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Inotropes and vasopressors are very potent drugs, and you shouldn't be surprised that there are significant complications that you need to watch out for. First off, if you're going to use an inotrope, it can cause hypotension, especially if the patient is volume depleted. Now remember, inotropes cause vasodilation, which will make the drop in blood pressure just that much worse if the tank is already empty to begin with. Hypoperfusion should also not be a terribly surprising complication of vasopressors. If you constrict a blood vessel enough, you're going to get ischemia. Now, the most obvious places to look for hypoperfusion is in the fingers, in the toes, and the nose, but this is really only an external indication of the severity of the vasoconstriction. Hypoperfusion will also occur at the mesenteric level, leading to gastritis, shock liver, intestinal ischemia, and also to translocation of gut flora. Using a potent adrenergic agent to stimulate the heart will inevitably also overstimulate the conduction system, leading to both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. The most common arrhythmia that you're going to encounter is atrial fibrillation, which unfortunately is very difficult to treat. The best way to guard against this is to be proactive in maintaining euvolemia.
Now finally, there is really no such thing as a free lunch and forcing the heart to pump harder and against more resistance ultimately comes at a cost. So again, you shouldn't really be terribly surprised that there, an already compromised heart will fail its stress test. If your patient is on high doses of vasopressors or inotropes, you need to watch out for both electrical and biochemical signs of myocardial ischemia. Well, that's all there is for today. We covered two groups of medications that have essentially defined critical care medicine, inotropes and vasopressors. We discussed the differences between inotropes and vasopressors as well as their receptor activity. We covered a number of practical issues that you need to consider, including when to use them, how to titrate them, and then we dived into the different agents, all the way from norepinephrine down to milrinone. We finally, we concluded by briefly going over some of the more common complications and side effects of inotropes and vasopressors, primarily hypotension and ischemia. Thanks for watching. Until next time.